is speciation occurs. You don't just see one lineage changing over time. Instead, you see lineages branch. Here's a case of what we call splitting. The formal word is speciation, where original lineage A branches into two new descendant species, B and C. And that usually takes a long amount of time. And this is the way that starting with a single ancestral species, somewhere about three and a half billion years ago, we arrive at today's count of 10 million to 50 million species on Earth. You could not do that unless you had this branching process. This is what's responsible for the tree of life. There's a nice tree of life t-shirts outside that you can buy. Okay, and again, this has to be verified separately from evolution. We could have evolution, but no speciation. In that case, we'd have a long evolved single species that was the descendant of the first species to occur. Now, this is proposition four, which is sort of the reverse side of looking at proposition three. That is, if you have a splitting process, but you look at it backwards, and again, this is what Richard did in Ancestors' Tale, you see that you have common ancestors, that every pair of species on Earth, no matter how closely or distantly related, if you go back far enough into the past, you'll find a single ancestral species that gave rise to them both. So this is proposition four, which you can look at as 3B, the reverse side of speciation. All species share a common ancestry as a result of lineage splitting from one ancestral life form. This, for example, is the family tree of primates. You can see the many splitting events evolved in the common ancestors. Our common ancestor with the chimp was about 7 million years ago, with the gorilla about 11 million years ago, with... Um, the lemurs about 40 to 50 billion years ago. So, and, and we could extend this back further and further and find common ancestors with birds, with frogs, with dandelions. Okay. And finally, the last part of evolutionary theory, and in many ways a very important one, is what causes evolution. And I will maintain that the vast amount of evolutionary change, although this is subject to dispute, is the result of the process of natural selection, the so-called survival of the fittest. And I will maintain that natural selection, or at least as part of the theory, is the sole process that can produce the appearance of design in organisms. The appearance of things that look as though God put them there to help the animal, like the elephant's trunk, the camel's hump, the polar bear's coat, and so on. So those are the five parts of evolutionary theory. And what I'm going to do now is show you the evidence that all of these five parts are true. Okay. And I hope you accept it at the end. And if you don't... You shouldn't be here for <laughs> first place. <laughs> I really feel like I'm preaching to the choir so much. I'm, why am I doing this? But I, I like it. That's right. What can I say? Um, so evolution is a scientific theory. It makes predictions. If you just read Darwin's first paper before his book, before he gave any evidence one year before in 1858, you could predict from what Darwin said the following. If life originated in the earth in the distant past and then evolved, subsequently splitting, we should see that the first detectable traces of life on earth would be simple. You cannot start life from chemicals in a complex way. You don't get an elephant springing out of a prim primordial ooze. And only later would more complex forms evolve. The simplest prediction you can make. If you look at the fossil record, which is now ordered not only relatively but absolutely, we know all the layers and we know all the dates that go with the layers. You see that it absolutely conforms to that prediction. We see the first real organisms on Earth that are undisputed are these cyanobacteria or blue-green algae that appear about 3.4 billion years ago, only about a billion years after the Earth was formed. And then more and more complex creatures form, shelled animals, land plants, fish, reptiles, and amphibian, one after the other, in an order which is almost predictable from looking at them today. Um, and the simpler forms remain. It's not that the simpler forms are there and go away. We still have shellfish with us. We still have bacteria. We still have fish. But more and more complicated things come in on top of that. This absolutely violates the prediction that all life was created at one time and never changed again. Um, completely refuting what the Discovery Institute or most creationist um, organizations maintain. Okay. This alone should be enough to refute creationism. But, but as they say in the Ginsu knife ads, but wait, there's more. Uh, <laughs> all right. Another prediction is that if evolution occurs within lineages and those lineages sometimes split, then we should be able to see that in the fossil record. We shouldn't just be able to see this progression from simple organisms to complex ones with the simpler ones remaining. We should be able to say, trace a single lineage and see it changing over time. After all, that's what evolution is. And we should be able to see those lineages split. 
so that we have an ancestor that divides into several descendants. And lo and behold, I could give you three or four hundred cases of this, but I'll just give you a couple to hopefully convince you of this. Um, some of the best evidence for evolution in the fossil record are, are found from marine microfossils, which are these tiny planktonic organisms that live in the sea. And why they're so good for evolution is, first of all, they usually have hard skeletons. Second of all, when they die, they just fall to the bottom, automatically ensuring that they l lie in the sediments. The sediments cover them up and preserve them. And you can get these whole groups of them, organisms. You can take a time slice of a single lineage of these organisms by simply drilling a core through the seafloor and then slicing that core into pieces, dating them, and seeing, following the lineage and how it looks and seeing how it changes. And here's one of them, a very simple organism. It's a diatom, a marine protist um, with a calcareous skeleton. And we can see that over the, the 1.7 million year slice of time, on the left here, and this is one characteristic of that, which is the size of the thing, an aspect of its size, that we see some evolutionary change happening. Sometimes it gets smaller, sometimes it gets bigger, smaller, bigger. Evolution doesn't always have to be unidirectional. There's no God propelling this. It's the environment, and the environment changes. So we see evolution here, but more important in this case, if we follow the core down, we see this as well, that we see the instant at which one lineage divides into two. That's not so easy in the fossil record, given the difficulty of fossilization. But in marine microfossils, it's easy. And lo and behold, what do we see? Evolution and speciation. And this lineage itself evolves, becoming smaller over the 1.5 million years that it exists. OK, and I could give you case after case after case. I mean, if you're a creationist, you'd tell me, so what? These are just diatoms. Give me something interesting, like a mammal, and show me evolution in that. OK, so here's a mammal. This is the horse. We have a really good fossil record of the horse, most of whose evolution took place in North America. Horses form a branching bush, just like many organisms do. There's no single lineage of horse. But if you follow some lineages, you see evolutionary change. One famous lineage is the one that goes from the, this common ancestor, Hyracotherium, a cute little animal about this big, evolving into the modern horse. And you see all kinds of evolutionary changes occurring on that lineage. It loses its toes, starts off with five toes, the two outer ones disappear, then the two middle ones disappear, and you're left with one toe left. It's an example of evolution. That's for creation. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but they don't all do that. It's not like every lineage of horse is forced to do this. Some of the lineages get smaller. So we see this branching bush, the speciation event, and in following some lineages, we see evolutionary change. OK, I'm not going to bore you to death by showing you example after example after example. You can go to my book, or you can go to Richard's book to see that. Okay? Let's go to some other predictions that evolution makes. Take the one on common ancestry and speciation. Okay? If all creatures share common ancestry, as Darwin maintained in 1858, where there was no evidence at the time, what do you expect to see? Well, we should be able to find some evidence of those common ancestors. We should be able to go back in time and see lineages converging and things that are supposed to be related. We should be able to find their common ancestor. Okay? We should be able to find these transitional forms. Okay? Now, two of the groups that evolution, that morphologists, people that study the way animals look and physiologists the way their bodies work, have told us before Darwin's time that birds appear to be closely related to reptiles. There's a number of similarities in the way their hearts are structured, in the way their, um, their circulatory systems are structured, that makes us think that perhaps um, birds evolved from reptiles. And we see reptiles early in the fossil record and no birds. And later on, about 150 million years ago, we still have reptiles, but now we, ha we see birds for the first time. So if it's true that birds came from reptiles, we should be able to find a common ancestor between those two. That's a prediction, OK? It was not known to be true. It was not known to be verified in Darwin's time. It was predicted, OK? So what we would like to see is a common ancestor of birds and reptiles, that one species, all of whose descendants on one branch gave rise to reptiles, the other descendants gave rise to birds. Now, finding a single species in the fossil record is almost impossible, given that less than one-tenth of one percent 